questions for reflection. Our first reading describes Paul's condition near the end of his life after giving all he had in service to the Lord. Paul is imprisoned in Rome. He's without friends. And all those who were previously close to him have abandoned him. He doesn't have his books to read or even a cloak. Yet Paul recognizes the truth of the situation. Although he is poor, imprisoned, and abandoned, he has no doubt about his purpose. He has and will continue to faithfully proclaim the gospel. Paul knows that his treasures are stored up for him in heaven. Many people abandon God when they face difficulties. They mistakenly assume that God will protect them from earthly troubles and mortal aches and pains. But we know this is false, for look at how much Jesus suffered. And no man has been more innocent. In these moments of difficulty, we face a choice. Shall we be as Paul's former companions who abandoned him? Or shall we be as Paul, faithful in the knowledge that the pain we suffer for following Christ can be a source of grace for us and others? When I was a little boy, my Catholic mother used to tell me, when I faced difficulties or pain, to offer it up. That's a simple way of explaining the beautiful biblical and Catholic teaching on redemptive suffering. Sometimes we're invited to embrace even that which we do not want as the means of our transformation. We've been given the grace to accept difficulties, struggles, and even at times, undeserved suffering. When it's embraced in love and for love, it can actually become the path to a deepening experience of the fruits of redemption. The Christian tradition instructs us that even undeserved and unmerited suffering, when joined in love to the sufferings of Jesus Christ, can produce extraordinary fruit within us, and then through us as we change. This is a part of the teaching on the mystery of suffering in the Christian life. St. Jose Maria Scriva once wrote, and I quote, the great Christian revolution has been to convert pain into fruitful suffering and to turn a bad thing into something good. We have deprived the devil of this weapon, and with it, we can conquer eternity. In today's responsorial psalm, we are invited to join all the creatures of the earth in continually thanking Yahweh. Let us rejoice that Yahweh is our God and that his kingship is eternal. David sings, he is close to all who call upon him, all who call on him from the heart. Let us be numbered among them offering a continual chorus of praise to the Lord. In today's gospel, Jesus is sending out the 72 with instructions for how to behave as they announce his coming. Notice how Jesus instructs them to take nothing with them, to be singular in their purpose, and to accept only that which kind people provide. This is the rule of life for many consecrated religious today who take vows of poverty. But it's also true for all Christians. We're called to live a form of what I call evangelical simplicity. Jesus was born in a manger. As an adult, he had no place to lay his head. He was raised in a simple home by a woman whose heart recognized true wealth. Remember the words that the angel spoke to Mary when she asked how it could be that she would bear the Messiah? Nothing is impossible with God. That's Luke 1.37. Mary understood that when you have the Lord, you have it all. She lived in the economy of heavenly scale, and if we choose to do so, we can live there too. There's an invitation to evangelical simplicity in God's loving plan for each one of us. And to those who voluntarily embrace it, evangelical simplicity can become a school of sanctity. Its embrace can change all relationships with persons as well as with the goods of the earth. Christians do not avoid economic struggle any more than they avoid relational struggles, suffering, hardships, and difficulty. That's not to say that the Lord cannot intervene and deliver us from all the effects of these very human realities. He often does. But when he does not, that does not mean he has not heard our prayer. Rather, it means that he has a different loving purpose in mind. This is also why we fast. We empty ourselves of things and of earthly cares so that we may be filled with grace. And grace is divine life. By eliminating distractions, we can focus on our singular purpose and become more effective witnesses of the gospel.